What does it mean for pastors to be political and how political should they be? That and more on this episode of The Unapologetic Show. Well, hello, Thinking Christians. Welcome to The Unapologetic Show with Dr. Bobby Conway, the one-minute apologist. I'm your host, Tim Hall. Here at The Unapologetic Show, we are set on defending truth without compromise. And one of the things that we're going to talk about today is this role, this kind of interplay between the state and the church and Christians and how they should function in that. What role should pastors play? What kind of policies should they be preaching about, talking about? Should they be doing that at all? So we're going to kind of cover a lot of that today. Bobby, maybe we can start with um, just... In Scripture, maybe, where should we begin looking at this? How should Scripture inform our view on this? Yeah. Well, when we look at the Bible, Tim, what we see is a lot of freedom. You know, think of the word form and function. Yeah. Okay, so there's biblical functions, and then there's forms. And so some of the biblical functions might be like community, discipleship, when it comes to things like evangelism. And then there's freedom of form and how that's done. Well, there was a proper function of government under the Old Covenant or during Old Testament times known as a theocracy. Okay. And this is set up, obviously, in the wilderness era uh, with Moses and God's people when God met Moses on Mount Sinai and mm-hmm. laying out the law. Uh, this was a very theocratic way of living. Yeah. And we can see a lot of laws that were put in place. Now, you fast forward, uh, and what did God's people do? Well, they didn't want a theocracy. They wanted a monarchy. Yeah. They wanted a king just like everyone else. Uh, we know that you had basically a theocracy, and then it shifted into the book of Judges, where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And then after the time of the judges, they were ready for a monarchy. So then you get Saul, and then you get David, and then you get Solomon, and there's a united kingdom. And then afterwards, uh, after Solomon, it's split into a divided kingdom. Yeah. And so then you have the north and the south, or Israel and Judah. Yep. Well, what ends up taking place is when the gospel comes on the scenes, God's people have been through the ringer. <laughs> they have been into captivity uh, with the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and they've come back to their land. Jesus comes in to the world at the perfect time at the precise time for the gospel to be spread. The Roman uh, roads were in place. Uh, They had the Greek common language. And what ends up taking place is the Romans are in charge. Uh, They're large and in charge at this time. And what you see taking place is Jesus saying things like, hey, render under Caesar's what is Caesar's and the God, what is God's? So they're not under uh, a democracy. They're under an emperorship at that time. Uh, And they're There are some laws that retain uh, that the Romans hold to that maybe you would see in a theocracy, like capital punishment. So, for example, uh, Romans 13, Paul says, you know, that these leaders don't hold the sword in vain. But what you've got is the function of government by the New Testament, the New Covenant, but there's freedom of form and expression. Mm. Where you don't have a freedom of form under the Old Covenant, you have the function of government, and the form is theocracy. Uh, Today... Uh, Christianity is expressed with all kinds of different governmental forms. And the question then becomes, how do we fit our Christianity into these various governmental structures that are out there? So would you look at, in light of that, and I think that's a great summary, would you look at something like Acts 2 as a, you know, as a political system that should be imposed on others, or is that something separate? Or how would you how would you think about Acts two and as it lays out that you know the people in the church were just being free and they were giving to one another and they were sharing all that they had? Is that is that a prescription <laughs> yeah. for government? Yeah. Or? Well, that's not a communist passage, <laughs> right? right? I mean, right. there's people that like to say you know they were you know breaking bread with one another and giving to everyone as they had need, and there's koinonia taking place in fellowship. Uh, I mean, there is a sharing mentality that the church has to have, right? We're to be generous. We're to care for others. We're to love our neighbor uh, as ourselves. We're to really show that kind of hospitality. Uh, but that doesn't mean that Marx and Engel 
Engels' Communist Manifesto is the accurate way or that they were expressing Acts chapter 2. Uh, that's absurd to understand it in that kind of a classism because what you got with like the governmental, uh, you know, or the, or the capitalism that's rejected by Marx and Engels yeah. is there's always this oppressor, the oppressed, this overthrow model that never ends. It yeah. just becomes very cyclical. Yeah. No, so that, that, that's great. So the American church particularly has been accused of having too much influence with movements like the moral majority, but then it's also been accused of sitting on the sidelines a lot of times. And so there's you know a little bit of play there, particularly in the civil rights movement of the 60s. And then we have, you know, kind of this, this is, this is just informing our conversation here. We have Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail responding to pastors who sat on the sidelines during the civil rights movement. So for you, what, what process should we go through? Because it seems like there's kind of this one end of the spectrum where it's like, you know, hands off from government. There's another end of the spectrum that's, you know, maybe you've described as like a social gospel type thing where the church should be highly involved and almost uh, in that, you know, kind of theocratic sense. We're really extremely involved in, in, um, in policymaking and politics. How should we think about that? What, what kind of things, uh, what kind of process should we go through to know when Christians should kind of speak up politically? Well, when we step back and we think about America, for example, let's keep in mind, I mean, they're, you know, our ancestors are leaving England, let's say, you know, mm -hmm. to two white dudes like ourselves, let's right. say, yeah. okay? Um, I've got a lot of English and Irish in yep. me. So, uh, you know, they're leaving England because they don't want to be under the oppression of the king. But sadly, it's like they didn't want to be oppressed, but we have a black eye on our early history because right. the Native Americans were oppressed. Right. And then there was slavery that was taking place, right? Where yeah. uh, you had slavery here in the early uh, founding of America that went on for quite some time. Uh, then you had some various opinions as it relates to setting up the new government, mm. right? You had Jefferson and John Hancock, uh, you know, the first yeah. one to, to kind of sign the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. And you've got some of these early leaders, and we're talking about separation of church and state, but then you have people like John Winthrop that says, oh, the church needs to be kind of that city on a hill. And so let's kind of get this old theocracy back in place. So it wasn't always real cleaned up and clear. Yeah. There was always kind of that, uh, you know, arm wrestling of how much government should be in there. And it's true that our early framers were saying, let's not put a lot of government in place, but- the thing is, is we talk about, you know, the role of Christianity, and I don't think the role of the church is to be like Islam, where mm -hmm. Islam is seeking to see Sharia law imposed everywhere. Right. And so that would be a form of theocracy, mm -hmm. where there was a purpose for a season for theocracy, and there's a lot that was to be learned under the yeah. theocratic government that we see with Israel. That's not God's intention. Mm -hmm. Rather, we are to uh, spread uh, the gospel, and that is supposed to be life-changing and culture-preserving. Preserving. The, when we live out our Christian life, that is a cultural preservative to a certain degree. Yeah. And so we need to realize that the power of Christianity is not in getting all these laws to be passed, but it's in living out the gospel. It's in mm -hmm. letting our life really attest to the value of life change. It, the church is really meant to outlive every other worldview. And in outliving every other worldview, we are to show that the principle that God has laid down for us in scripture mm. is the, the best way then to live. So stepping back then, I think that, yeah, you have had people like the moral majority. You have had people that have sat on the sidelines, uh, you know, and you're right. Uh, MLK Jr. wrote letters from a Birmingham jail to, to reprimand yeah. pastors and say, hey, you know what? You need to do something about yeah. it. You think even a Billy Graham, uh, he was pulling down, uh, you know, the, the strings that were dividing people yeah. at his crusades where the blacks and the whites were separate. He was, you know, opposite operating out of social justice. And yeah. so there is a place where we need to speak up, Tim. There are issues that we need to, uh, to, to be engaged in, but that doesn't mean that we need to force our values as Christians into uh, law. Mm -hmm. it, it means that we can live out our beliefs and it means we need to vote and we, need, and we should express our voice, but we don't need to become coercive in the way that we do it. So if you're looking at kind of general policies in that sense where you're 
or let me just kind of summarize, you're thinking that as long as a law isn't necessarily limiting our ability to live out our Christian walk, that we should kind of lay that aside. And if it, where it is, you know, preventing us from being able to live out our Christian walk, that's where we should be a little bit more vocal. Or how would you, you know, would you add yeah. anything to that? I think, well, I think that that is a good principle. So biblically speaking, uh, I think that we can comply with the government, mm-hmm. right? Uh, insofar as they don't ask us to do anything that compromises our biblical convictions. Mm. So take Daniel, for example. Yeah. Daniel prayed three times a day. And what was it that, um, you know, that they tried to do to get Daniel to, to compromise. Mm-hmm. They used his faith against him. They knew if they went to the king, hey, check it out, you know, let's pass this edict where you, you know, you can't pray. Right. Well, Daniel uh, was going to pray. Yeah. He didn't let that stop him. Mm. In the same way, in the New Testament, um, the apostles were sharing the gospel and they tried to silence him. And they said, you know, far be it from you to silence us. We need to be obedient to God first and foremost. Right. And he said, Lord, consider their threats and enable us to have great boldness. So if the government tries to tell us we can't share the gospel, well, we should not comply with that. Now, we right. might want to be wise in how we go about sharing it so that we don't just you know, walk out and get put in jail immediately. Right. We might want to think about the best way to do this. But remember, that's what they did. They locked them up in jail, and then they were back out <laughs> sharing right away. Yeah. So I think that there are things that we need to make sure that we don't compromise on. Like, yeah, so how do we obey the government? Well, we comply insofar as they don't ask us to compromise. So mm. when it comes to like things like LGBTQ, I watch so many Christians throwing out what the Bible has to say and just falling right into place with this. Right. And I could see us getting challenged on this area more and more, and it's going to require us to ask, are we going to be faithful to what the Scripture says, or what are we going to do? Now, let's say this. Uh, you do have something very interesting. Uh, you take Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for example. Yeah. He yeah. seeks to have Hitler, uh, you know— annihilated, right? They, they sought to blow Hitler up with a bomb yeah. and this failed attempt. And he was a part of a group known as the Confessors there in mm-hmm. Nazi Germany. Mm-hmm. And so his approach was to destroy Hitler. And you can see that morally, like, my goodness, yeah, wouldn't it be better just to get rid of Hitler right. than for all the atrocities that Hitler's causing? Yeah. But then you think about Paul writing to Romans and talking about how we're to submit to governmental authorities, and who's the governmental authority? Nero. Right. Well, who's Paul going to die at the hands of? Nero. Yeah. He's going to be beheaded by him. Yeah. And so it's almost shocking to think that Paul was saying, hey, we need to comply. So it kind of seems like as much as you can go along with the government, do so insofar as is where they're trying to muzzle you in your Christianity. Mm. And I don't know that the line is cleaned up as well. Like I kind of side with Bonhoeffer. I get that. But I go... Why wasn't Paul trying to blow up Nero? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, no, that, that's that's good. So you, you speaking of jail, right? You mentioned it a few times. So <laughs> well, uh, particularly in America, what are the legal implications in America, specifically for American pastors, that they need to be aware of when they're speaking on political topics? There's some there, there's some things that we need to address in that area before we go too far. Yeah, well, there's going to be things that it could maybe threaten our 501c3 status. Right. Okay, and so that is something that we need to be aware of. A 501c3 status is basically a nonprofit status that yeah. is given to churches that allows people to get their tax write-offs. Mm-hmm. Uh, it allows you to not be, you know, pay taxes on items that are used for the church and yeah. certain benefits like that. Now, I think that that 501c3 status is a benefit, and we're thankful for that. Yeah. I would fully expect at some point that that's going to go away. Uh, I, I hope it doesn't. It, yeah. It's a great benefit. Yeah. Uh, but I think that people will hold, government will hold that status over and say, hey, this is going to get taken away if you. So, mm. for example, I think as it relates to some of these gender issues, uh, you know, LGBTQ+, I do not think that that movement is going to be satisfied until the Bible is completely redefined for right. what it means. Right. And we as Christians are going to have to say, are we going to compromise mm. or are we going to hold fast to what the Scriptures teach there? Yeah. And I think that if the government starts passing laws that puts us in a place where we are muzzled on what the Bible has to say about marriage, I think that 
you're going to have pastors speaking up and Christians speaking up, and you could lose your 501c3 mm -hmm. status. You could see Christians getting arrested. Uh, you could see all kinds of things. So the government, when they pass these types of laws, they need to really realize what they're up against. There, there's no way if the LGBTQ community thinks that they're just going to force Christians, uh, they're, they're, they're going to get some people that are going to be weak yeah. and they're going to comply and they're just not going to want the problem. But they're, you're never going to, you're, you're going to, you're going to have a, a massive battle. Yeah. So the better battle would be how do we recognize that we can love each other, but mm -hmm. without agreeing with one another? Right. Like as Christians, we could recognize that we live in a culture where same sex marriage is there and that's fine. Uh, we're not going to cause problems to that, but that doesn't mean that in the church, we're going to teach that that's God's right. way. Yeah. But that also doesn't mean that if somebody comes as a gay couple, that, that we're going to be mean-spirited and right. unloving, exactly. and that we can't go out for dinner together or, 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 or connect as friends. That doesn't mean that at all. Mm. But if you want to force us to say, we can't believe our beliefs anymore, that's just going to be, that. that is going to be a bloody battle. That's going to yeah. be all kinds of litigation, lawsuits. It's going to cause people to go to jail. It's going to be a fight. And it's going to be a fight built on the wrong narrative. It's going to be a fight that's going to say that we don't really love LGBTQ community because of our beliefs. And that's yeah. not the case at all. That, yeah. that's, that's, that's a straw man argument. Right. It's, we're just trying to be faithful as Christians to what the Bible says about the context of marriage. And we want to be faithful to have our voice, and that's fine. Yeah. We believe that the LGBTQ community should also have their voice. But that doesn't mean that we can't have our voice in the church. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, I, I, want, I wanted to get a little bit more specific on some of these things. But first, I want to let our audience know that this is also this show is also in an audio only podcast. So hello to our podcast listeners. If you're checking us out on YouTube, you know, go ahead and like this video, subscribe if you're interested in more of these conversations. And I do want to point out, Bobby just kind of mentioned real quickly, um, kind of some thoughts on the LGBTQ community. We did an episode about that. You can find that again on our podcast and on our YouTube channel where he kind of lays out more context, more detail in there about his views and how uh, we should address that in the church and what that would look like. So we want to go back and invite you to check out that show if you uh, want some more information about that. So, Bobby, we're talking a little bit specifically here. So d do you think that Christians should be, uh, you know, voting on things like abortion or things like, you know, the government's power to be able to end poverty and some of those things? Where, where do you fall? Where, where, where should, you know, Christians fall or, or pastors <laughs> yeah. fall or specifically you in this case on some of those issues when it yeah. comes to policies? And well, for me personally, uh, I, you know, I'm an independent and I'm thankful yeah. that I am uh, because I feel like there's enough obstacles uh, as it relates just to getting people to digest the gospel. Right. So I purposely am independent and I... I, I try to listen to both sides. I mean, I'll yeah. flip back and forth between liberal and conservative channels and listen to both sides uh, of, of the issues. Uh, but I do think that um, it's important that while as pastors, uh, you know, we're not trying to create a certain party. And that's what yeah. ends up happening in some churches. It's like, why is everybody in this church Democrat? Or why is everybody in this church Republican? For me, that's not my goal, to get yeah. people to be Republicans or Democrats. Yeah. My goal is for us to love Jesus, uh, love people, and celebrate the gospel. Yeah. And when it comes to these issues, though, in the Bible, so let's say, uh, what would this look like? in a practical way. Voting season's coming up. I don't think pastors need to be getting up and saying, this is why you need to vote Republican or why you need to vote Democratic. But I do think it's good to be able to say, these are the issues that are on the board. Um, what does the Bible have to say about sexuality in its context? Mm -hmm. What does the Bible have to say about life? What does the Bible have to say about environment? Mm -hmm. What does the Bible have to say about poverty and helping the poor? Yeah. What does the Bible have to say about, you know, maybe sex trafficking or what are some principles we can gain there. Yeah. And then hopefully if you teach the biblical principles, then it becomes clear who you're voting for. Right. Right. And then I think sometimes people struggle going, well, then how do I rank the different aspects yeah. of like abortion, sex trafficking, environment, um, these different issues, racism. We talk about this stuff and you help people to think Christianly, mm. biblically. And then when they go into a voting booth, uh, they're now... I do think what will happen a lot of times is there is going to be 
Christians that are by and large going to vote more conservative mm-hmm. because of some of the values as it relates to to, to marriage and family, right. um, as it relates to you know the LGBTQ stuff versus you know trying to preserve. But I do think what you could see happening in America though pretty soon, it's kind of like in in Britain, uh, you know there there you know you've got the the so called conservative party, yep, but yep. it's not really conservative, yeah, right? Yeah, uh, I mean it's, it's American conservative. Yeah, yeah, it's not, yeah. and you could end up having that in our culture someday, where right. now it what once was a conservative party, it, it's really just a little bit more conservative than the liberal party. Right, yeah. And I think one of the things to keep in mind is how difficult sometimes, particularly in America, because the context that we're, you know, the world that we're swimming in here, the pond that we swim in, is that it's really difficult because you're voting, you know, for one person almost, one person for president or one person for Senate or one person for, you know, your local government. And you may not agree with them on all of their different perspectives, right. but you then have to get into that, what you're talking about, what are your values and 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 whatnot, and how are those going to play out, not only in what we value, because sometimes I think even in America here, the right and the left tend to have similar values, but they want to implement those values in different ways. They, the, way, the way that you carry those values out exactly. could be different. So for, from your perspective, uh, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, what the role of the, the pastor, the leader of the church is. How are some ways that you would suggest um, a pastor should go about teaching on some of these moral issues? Is, is it from the pulpit on a Sunday morning? Are there certain things that you would address there? Is it in some other fashion, whether it's a podcast or whether it's some sort of class? How, how would you, where would you make yeah. those delineations? Well, for me, Tim, I mean, one of the things, you know, now that I'm pastoring again, when voting season comes up, I think it's good to offer voters guides. Mm-hmm. So just to let people be aware that there's voters guides out there. Um, I think one of the big things is, you know, I think you can teach on um, what it, the Bible has to say as it relates to government, and yeah. like what we're talking about. But I think offering a course on ethics. Okay. And maybe, you know, every four years you just do a series called The Issues We Face. Mm. And you help people to think Christianly about these issues. Yeah. So like for me, like the abortion thing, um, you'll end up having some people like um, abortion, you know, you know, there's other issues that are you yeah. know important besides yeah. abortion. Well, there are other issues that are important, but abortion is still important. Right. We're talking about terminating, uh, you know, life. And I think that now we're seeing what potentially looks like we might see an overturn of Roe v. Wade, yeah. but that doesn't mean that absolves everything. It just means it's going to get yeah. thrown back to the states and right. we're going to have all kinds of countless litigation battles that are going to take place. Right. But I think that that's my fear. I sense some of these churches uh, and pastors, they're wanting to you know, be about social justice and helping us to be more integrated as it relates to uh, racial issues, which is beautiful. Yeah. But they're using it in the way of saying, you know, we, the church has been so obsessed with the abortion issue. So now it's almost like they're going silent. And I'm thinking, we don't need to be silent on that, nor do we need to be silent on these racial issues. Yeah. We need to teach that, um, you know, that it's important to protect the life in the womb. And we need to teach that it's important that, that the ground is level at the the cross and that mm-hmm. God is, is is passionate about ending racial issues in our life and racism is a sin problem. And we need to be passionate about teaching what the Bible has to say about marriage and being in the context between a man and a woman. And not only that, uh, when we talk about LGBTQ plus stuff, we can talk about heterosexual stuff too. Right. I mean, I can say as right. a guy who wasn't saved when I was 19, I was incredibly promiscuous and I came to a place where I believed yeah. that that I had lost all self control mm-hmm. because I was a I was a slave to my lust, yeah. Yeah. and God allowed me to meet my wife as a new Christian, and we were able to wait until right. we were married. Yeah. I had all kinds of um, you know sexual bondage in my life, yeah. but I'm so thankful He allowed us to wait, and I believed that I was operating in a way that was unbiblical. Right. So I'm not just picking on LGBTQ community in this, yeah. but we have to not compromise on these issues, and we need to share our voice and help people to think biblically. Well, I think that, that's that, that's an excellent point. Thank you for bringing that up. And again, I think uh, what you just summarized there at the end with that story, again, beautiful story, beautiful testament there, is the difference between um, like a pastoral approach or even just a Christianly approach to that with other humans. And when you're looking at policies, right, those are very different roles. And we kind of laid that out in the beginning. So I uh, really appreciate that. Any final thoughts or, or caution or cautionary tales here uh, as we wrap this show up? Hey, vote for Tim Hole for president. <laughs> no, I don't want to I don't want that role of president. Bobby, right? No, no, it's you, Tim. All you, baby. <laughs> you got this. <laughs> Man, I've never, you know, I've never really thought about running for 
any kind of political <laughs> office ever. It's never been a call yeah. in my life. Have you ever thought about? <laughs> no way. No, yeah. It's no way. Not something. I mean, like again, I like being involved in the social conversation. I like being involved in you know kind of what's going on and understanding the issues like we were talking about. But I just have no desire to be in that role at all. Yeah. It's just interesting. So, well, for you, the audience, thank you so much for checking out this podcast. As I mentioned earlier, you can find this on any podcast software, Apple, you can go to Podbean, you can check it out at our website, one minute And our show is a listener and viewer supported show. So we would encourage you if you can to join our financial team, you can do that at our website as well. Click on donate in the upper right hand corner. And with that, we will meet you next time on the unapologetic show. 